advanced age, as knowledge he puts it, get into that particular subject because the whole question of consciousness, latent consciousness, manifest consciousness, individualized consciousness. And by golly, if you have never gotten into a real can of worms, I'll pick up those two words together and toy with it for a century or two. Individualized consciousness. Anyway, Gary, to get back to your particular point, I always have to go back, I think it's in one of the very first pages of God's speech, or maybe somewhere in the early discourses, uh, where Baba talks about uh, the original, original, beyond, beyond state of God. And somehow or another, in that, he certainly says that uh, God is infinite. And it's everything, there's nothing outside of God. And uh, he also says that there are certain things in the original, original, beyond, beyond state of God, uh, where things are latent. And so the latency, telling you, there's an awful clever guy in the north of England who started putting together the various things that he picked up, uh, which are in the latency. And I, I finally saw what he was doing. I said, gee whiz, this is absolutely brilliant. I think this is the population chart of the latency of God. And that was one of the most uh, revealing and fascinating things I think we ever went through. But at any rate, uh, in that, my recollection is the two things that have always impressed me most that are in the original, original, original state of God and the latency are consciousness and the wind. Go ahead, that's a neat bag of tricks. I don't know how God managed to get such powerful things into a quiet stage in his original, original state. But then when you're came to life and started getting happy. And so uh, the latent consciousness was totally latent um, because it is in God and because God is infinite. And as Baba keeps pointing out, uh, you and everything else are God. The only difference between you and me is I know consciously I am God, and you don't know it yet. And I thought that was just such a wonderful, beautiful statement. You know. It just sort of maps out uh, things as uh, where they are really. So, in other words, uh, anything that qualifies as a drop soul, apparently, when this latency in God to know His divinity consciously moved to Him to know His consciousness consciously. This infinity consciously began to move and created such a, you know, like the wind going over the surface of the lake and uh, sort of stirring up bubbles and so on. And I guess it's one of the most charming ways of looking at it. So any of these bubbles, if you stop to think of it, just remember back uh, anything that is around is God. So it's got to have what God has. And so each drop soul has to have latency of consciousness, which it is pretty well fated uh, to handle, manipulate, and bring to a manifest stage. It's not created. Just remember, consciousness always was, but it was latent. The drop soul manages one way or another to bring a parcel of it into a manifest developed stage where it's alive and apparently has gone through quite a bit of uh, interesting happenings along the line and a few crises here and there. Does that sound sort of familiar? <laughs> you stop giggling, so... <clears throat> he knows uh, my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> so, at any rate, this is really a very great process. Very exciting. So, Gary, um, would that make any sense to you as to what con where consciousness is 
It's yeah. an inherent property of everything. And every drop soul has got its own latent consciousness, which gradually becomes manifest. And then Baba tosses in this other word again and again and again, and God speaks individualized. Yeah. And that's where you and me and all of our friends and enemies too pop into the thing. Individualized. And so we've been arguing in London and Paris and other points in the country uh, about uh, whether the individualized consciousness is permanent on the scene. What happens to it, for instance, so when you get God realized? I'd just like to toss that back at you, Barry, since you tossed the first one to bed. What do you, what do you think happens to it? When Baba says individualized consciousness, which is the retain, my impression, in my own words, is that uh, after realization, when only the soul is there in its infinite state, in a sense, it's when only the soul the soul the soul is there mm -hmm. to experience that it is not the sanskaras anymore it is not looking through its matrix of sanskaras the soul knows it has the consciousness to know its own triune nature of infinite knowledge infinite power and infinite bliss but even though on some level uh, this is applying human terms that it knows that the process to get to God realization and conscious of self was illusory. It's sort of, to me, the image I said before, it's almost like it, it has the stamps in its passport of where it has traveled, even though that was an illusory trip, that those were certain paths, that it, the, the road map of consciousness is somehow imprinted on it. It does not take away from it its infinite knowledge, power, and bliss. But it, it is, it has like an impression of its journey that it went on as an individualized being through creation. It has an impression. Now, uh, does anybody know Gary enough to tell me, give me a tip whether he's in a good, uh, uh, flexible mood today or yeah. whether he can just knock me over the head no, 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 no. and out of the door if I get too sassy and naughty here. Yeah, come on. Okay. Just go. <laughs> if you say, come on, I'm going yeah. to say. What if I said, uh, I'm not just so sure that uh, the goal is to come to all of this uh, realization of God. What if I have gradually been pushed into the thing that the goal of everything uh, is really to individualize and manifest God's latent consciousness? And to hell with all of this God realization thing is sort of a inevitable. Is this naughty enough to toss us into <laughs> so uh, But what is it? Can you clarify that a bit? That to manifest God's consciousness. But in a sense, in our human form, according to God Speaks, mm -hmm. consciousness is full and complete. So it is now as full as it will get, even though all of us here are clouded by sanskaras, mm -hmm. I assume. Um, but our consciousness is as full and complete as it will ever be. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you figure that full consciousness, and I guess to go back to your statement, full consciousness of one's own God is the goal. It seems that the process, as Bob calls it, when beyond beyond state of God has the wind, beyond state of God is created, and in that beyond state there is substate A, which is unconscious, substate B, which is conscious God, and somehow that road through evolution and reincarnation and evolution leads that path across that imaginary ocean from unconscious to conscious. So it seems that that's how the game was set up. And for the souls that enter, they somehow will wind up, those who start out in A will wind up in B. Well, now, uh, what, if, what if my uh, naughty whim goes on being naughty and I say, well, I don't think this is quite complicated enough yet, but we better get it a little bit more complicated and confusing in order to get a little closer to reality. And I, I would just say, well, where does love and God and love and 
uh, all this constant statement, of course, uh, that there has to be love, there has to be a lover, and there'll be love of it. And how does God and consciousness and all of that get entangled into that? If it's just to get God realization and know what's one, or where does this terribly important thing that Baba and everybody nowadays just loves to heart on all the time? Love, love, love. Sometimes I get <laughs> I realize that's me continuing in my naughty streak. So did, did you have your hand up? I raised my hand. I said, I'd like to answer Does somebody else want to raise their hand? Yeah, anybody's free to get tired of him? Right back in the back. Will, will you hold yeah, your hand? I will hold my yes. thought. Right. Wait, right wait back there. Wait back leaning on the window. Yes. Yeah. 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 Hiding in the back. Um, well, it always, the question, a question that always intrigued me was that <clears throat> it seems, I believe that Baba said that the purpose of the creation was for God unconscious to become God conscious. But then it seemed to me that once the first, that one soul, Adam, or whoever became God conscious, then the purpose has been fulfilled. So why does the game go on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then what you're saying seems like an appealing answer that the individual, the game of the individualized soul mm -hmm. going through the process of the lover-beloved relationship in many, many different kinds of ways was more interesting to God than God realization. Mm -hmm. So you're hinting that maybe actually the purpose of creation is to make love possible and this infinitude of God somewhere or another by breaking up uh, uh, infinitude into small pieces and infinite number of small pieces. That's another type of infinitude, isn't it? If we are mathematicians, it's a problem. You know, infinitude can just be a flat expanse that goes on indefinitely. Or it could be an infinite series of numbers, too, and they're both infinite. It may be possible that God is an infinite series of individualized dropped souls all gathered together and able to love in the whole process. Can this be something that's involved here and is pretty integral for us? I see another hand back there. Well, um, based on what you're saying right now, it raises a question to me. It appears to me your countenance looks different from when I... No, you said the word countenance. Your countenance appears different to me than any time I've seen you before. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I conjecture that there's been something on your individualized process of identifying with that God within mm -hmm. that might have shifted. Mm -hmm. Well, I've done a lot of shifting through this. Probably race. tons, but, <laughs> but I'm just curious if there's anything in particular that's different for you in the way you're seeing things right now. Well, you know, this tempts me to make a personal confession that that could go on all night, and so I don't dare get into it. But I just have to tell you that the most exciting years of my life have been the last ten. And so many, many, many things that I experienced with Baba, I didn't know where the hell to stack them or to store them, you know, have just been coming up and coming up and coming up and making sense and fitting in. I hope we can get into some of those exciting things that just get me terribly excited. So that's why my countenance is different. I have experienced just so much fulfillment related to this whole process of individualization or maybe it fits into Bob and God's scheme, but it gets terribly exciting and new. So, yes, uh, we, we've got an awful lot of things that we can potentially dip into today. Uh, I think, <clears throat> to be perfectly honest, that we are just really getting over the edge uh, of, from out of the forms and patterns, and we thought we knew it all, of the old cycle of cycles, of avataric cycles. And getting into the new ones that Baba, the new one. Remember, Baba did say, and Aries confirmed this two or three times to me. Baba said, I mark the end of the old cycle of avataric cycles and the new avataric cycle of cycles. 
will begin. This is what I associate the new humanity with, the new life, all of these new age things you know. For me, they're just terribly real. And I even suspect that uh, what we are getting into now is something as radical as a new cycle of avatar cycle. And just think of the implied expanse of what that means. And so this implies, you know, that perhaps, uh, I always call it, uh, I think God is opening up a new homesteading of a new area of infinite consciousness with totally different principles, basic principles, which Baba went into and put into another uh, form so that we human beings can trace it through. Remember Baba said, I have completed my universal work when he came out. Uh, I guess it was a new life of some of the retreats that I went into. And they're now established so that they are permanent, even if there is not a single human being to live them. But boy, that took, and I discussed this several times with Harris, just a tremendous amount of quiet time and seclusion, not even the mongoly interrupted, just food would come through a shuttered door and the guy got the hell out of there, you know, real fast not to disturb him. Well, that sort of concentration and freedom uh, from distraction implies just a whole new type of avataric responsibility. We have never heard stories of Jesus Christ doing that uh, or of the early avatars doing things of that sort. The avatar apparently in this avatar but was up to some whole huge chain and we're right on the cusp of it as I see and feeling into these new forms that Baba and Mwanda would come convince them a new life set up as far as they can be set up. Now it's up to the human beings and the new humanity to live them through. But many of these things are implied in uh, Baba. He gives a little hint here and there. And I think God's speech is just an absolute treasure of leading us up to the very beginning of all of this newness and then leaving the implications of it for us to intuit as part of the new humanity. It's a terribly exciting period to be in. But this, I feel, is why he gave us his avatar and gave to us that of intuition. Because this will be the tool where you can make progress terribly rapidly, but you just can't abandon reason totally. So we are, I am convinced, especially the devotees of Mayor Baba, the leading edge of the new humanity, feeling into the forms and even the mystic processes uh, that Avatar Mayor Baba set up with the Mahabharata in the new life. It, it makes such tremendous sense. So, um, <clears throat> does that lead us into um, the implications? <clears throat> Sorry, the implications of maybe how intuition may be used or necessary tool in this new, new, newness that Baba has set up in form, and that now it's up to us to go ahead and live it into reality. But it's an awfully big charge that we've got uh, on our backs here. Do you want to talk a little bit about intuition? Yes, Mary, please. And maybe it fits <laughs> into all of this? Yeah. Well, uh, can, can we just go back to two stories that both of which I got direct from Bob himself and impressed me tremendously. That is Bob's words and the atom bombs of spiritual uh, energy. Um, the other one has to do with this business of uh, intuition, which when he announced it in Monsley Hall of Mares, uh, I think somewhere in the middle to almost the late 60s, I was absolutely dumbfounded because I'd never heard anything about his avatar and gift of humanity. And so when he said, my avatar and gift of humanity is Jesus Christ was that of love and the was this and uh, Krishna's was that I think associated with the concept of reincarnation and so on. These great, great um, you know, milestones. Uh, that we have to lead us along. They mean so much 
and esoteric thought and logic. Uh, but the, to hear Baba say that my avatar gift is out of uh, intuition, I said, good heavens. I thought I had read Baba's literature pretty well by that time and discussed many things with it. But this is the first time I've ever heard of that. And, uh, and not many months later, he said it the second time. And then I began to find out that he had not uh, put this forth. But this was absolutely brand new material that he had trotted out in Mondeley Hall before 10, 15 people, you know, by a small house, not in some great huge gathering uh, with Tom Hanks meeting and so on. So this, this is one of the most important things we have to deal with. And I'm convinced myself that it is his avatar and gift, simply because it has to be used so much in relation to the new life and particularly to that great central signpost in the new life of what he gave us or he says God gave the direct uh, God speaks. So the other thing, the other story, and I've told it a dozen times, and forgive me for telling it again, but it is so terribly important. On two occasions when Baba, Arish, and Don were sitting Mondali Hall, Narazan, and working over various different things in the editing. I think actually at that time we were uh, midway in my rumbling through the national discourses and getting it into what then became the book three book six edition, and then later Harish and Balnat to and Flag and Plan Chris uh, put it into the seventh edition. So, uh, somewhere along in that, <clears throat> I brought up uh, the fact uh, that uh, maybe all of this work that we were doing at that time uh, was kind of sort of going to waste. And Bob's uh, question is, yes, where are you getting the so and so? And I said, well, almost ready to go to uh, the printers. And he said, well, that's good. And then I added on, but I don't know what good it's all going to do, if you remember this. Stephen's lone head statement in the avatar. I don't know what all of this good working on your with words you might be doing. And then I kick myself all over the map and Papa did look shocked. <laughs> that, was, you know, that was Stephen's being naughty in the avatar and he let me know it with his look of shock. So anyway, uh, he said, what do you mean by that? This was Irish, just words of Baba's gesture. So then I knew I was stuck and I said, Baba, you know, uh, I've been around so many people nowadays uh, who have the firm conviction that anything that has words, concepts, logic, reasoning involved is an impediment to the spontaneity of the heart, which is the real source of, let's say, esoteric and development. And uh, so, uh, so many people simply will not read the book. And uh, so he and Aris go into a deep, deep, deep uh, Gujarati exchange. Usually, when they exchange, uh, they did it in English, so I would at least hear what Aris was saying back to Baba, I get half of it. But in this one, they were at, come on in. It's not forbidden, you can even squeak the screen door. <laughs> We are sitting in the um, there and we're exchanging Gujarati. I think it was at least 10 15 minutes. Every once in a while, when we were working on something, Bob and Harris would go into a private conversation, but they would usually get it done. Bob and I had the sharpest mind that was ever created as a, as a set cerebral. And in creation, and he could go through things, you know, that you and I and philosophical experts would take days. And he'd go through in a few minutes. So most of this conversation, this one really had both Bob and Harris Buffalo for quite a bit. So finally, Bob leans back in his chair and just looks a little bit old and a bit tired. He didn't often do that. And so uh, Harris says, well, Don, as you can see, it's been difficult to try to get this in proper words what Bobby wanted me to explain to you. And he said, the closest that I can get to it is that in 
certain instances when, especially when Baba is giving out words very carefully to be published to go out all over the world, or every once in a while when he has not been uh, present uh, to see a group that he's very fond of, and uh, then is going to see them for the first time maybe in months or years, uh, he will specially prepare an address to them. And each time that it goes in this particular manner, he chooses the mandali to give the key concepts to. That mandali makes notes, takes them back to their room, works up the notes into a more full version because they know Baba so well that they know uh, in, in great detail what Baba is driving up, bring the whole then leaving out the material that Baba had dictated briefly the day before. Back to Baba, reads it out word by word, and then Baba goes over each word, and each word, which is not exactly what Baba intends, discusses it with the person until the right word expressing exactly what Baba intends is chosen. And then Baba had Harish explain to me that if it was a very, very difficult thing every once in a while, particularly when Baba was starting to give up the alphabet more, Baba would have the person repeat the alphabet, A, B, C, D, and F, when they got to the right. You've perhaps seen pictures, and we've even got uh, a, bit, uh, a tape of Baba making that flapping. So I say this is the closest to Baba speaking that we've got. So that was a fundamental tool. Baba told this uh, in order to impress upon me that when these were words which were extremely important, then he took all of his time and he said, and Don, I want you to know that these special words that have been handled in this manner, and on two occasions he had Harish explained the same thing to me. When Baba does it in this manner, he attaches onto his words uh, something like an atom bomb of spiritual uh, energy. Now, there had been a little part of the conversation that I omitted, but it was very, very key when Baba was saying to me as uh, well. But, but what's going on with the people and I was trying to explain that they had a phobia against word and logic and philosophy and so on. And this is why they didn't like dealing with words. And he had come back and put one other question to me. And Don, do they say this about Baba's words? And that put a dagger right in my heart because I had by that time heard too many people say just very simply, not intending to be cute or negative or tearing down, but I, I can't even read Baba's words. I've never even read Baba's words to explain the depth of their conviction and their inability to connect words and logic to something they felt deeply had to be from the heart spontaneous and so on. So that was when Baba went into this long exercise. <clears throat> so what he was then bringing out was that there were certain special types of words, not all of Baba's words, but on um, special occasions in the publishing, such as God Speaks. All of the eight chapters that he dictated to Harish, <clears throat> he emphasized, were given in this meticulous manner. And there were others too who didn't say this was and that wasn't and so on. But it was pretty obvious <clears throat> that these were very special. And he said, Now, I want you to know also, Don, that if a devotee of mine works with these special words, and he used this example, even if he does not understand logically two words of what he has read, Still, his very process of association and working with these words will cause him, and I used a, a word from biology, by an osmotic process, to absorb some, an important part of the energy charge associated with these words. And those words, the energy that he sees, uh, has absorbed will be key in his spiritual progress. 
Now this to me was just terribly important. Uh, I remember, I think, one of the most touching human uh, situations I've ever been around in relation to this particular process. There's a lovely girl who is, has been rather almost completely... James Frankel? No, I think it's from J. Bach, but I don't So he's J. Bach, not here? No, I thought he was here. Not here. Not here. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, she has been bedridden. She loves Bob and she has a husband who was able to keep coming to the, the God Speaks and uh, so on. But he was one of the first persons after Baba dropped the body who uh, was in the first mm -hmm. original discourse study group in London. And he was the poor, beautiful in London. He had carried his messages back to Norma. That's why. And Norma got very impressed, she told me, and made me, uh, that it was so important to work with Baba's words to absorb these atom bombs, some of the atom bombs of spiritual energy. And she said, Don, I, I just felt that uh, what Keith was telling me was important and true. And so I tried studying God's speech and reading it carefully. And I found I couldn't keep my attention on it more than a few minutes. And then I would get tired. So she said, well, I still have a small circle of friends who are willing to come around and say hello to me. So we formed a little study group to study God's speech together. And she said, I love these people, and they love me, and we made really a desperate attempt to study God's speech and to do it really with a deep internal contact with the words and their inner meaning. And she said, I, I just have to tell you, I couldn't do it still. I knew that I had reached the point of really being able to establish an inner contact with the words. And she said, then suddenly uh, I thought, well, I've always noticed that I like to do handicraft things with my uh, fingers and to do sewing and uh, designs and things of that particular sort. And she said, so I thought, well, maybe if I just get out a, a blank notebook and uh, pick a paragraph a day, maybe, and write out longhand that paragraph, Maybe with my tactile sense and its reality form, maybe that will form the key. And she said, I did that. And you cannot believe on what happened. I came in that first paragraph to one sentence, and as I wrote that sentence, every puzzle in my life seemed to be put in place and resolved. And she said it deeply and honestly. And I was so touched by that. And she said, no, it's now several months later and I haven't had a chance to write this to you. But again and again, when puzzling things would come up in my life, I would go back to that paragraph and I would rewrite in my hand that sentence. And again, there would be something of tremendous clarification that would come internally, intuitively to me. A tremendous, tremendous marriage between the written word, the atom bombs, and the use of this girl's intuition by a meaningful uh, process that she knew meant something to her. But this is the way we have to, to handle these treasures. We've got to find the inner, real role, which is for us. It is so individualized. You know, Paula, I can't remember how many times I've been around her when he would remind us again, you know, uh, the path to God, there, there are no two paths to God which are identical. It is an extraordinarily individual process, individualized process. And so we, we've got to live with our individualization, the keys to these things, and be willing to put up with them, and just keep insisting and going back and back and back and not what's real for us. So I think this is absolutely true also of intuition. And intuition can go way in and find, suggest an individualized path, and then carry the words. I think Baba did a deliberate job <coughs> of leading us through the massive basic mechanics and right up to the application 
where we as human beings have to pick it up. But then it's an individualized process. So I think this is where we have to put our individual intuition on the line. I don't know how much of the time we've got available. We're going to go, if you're, hmm? you know, if your voice Are we just up, we could go to 6 o'clock. So. 6 o'clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Well, um, at any rate, we've got a few minutes. <clears throat> so what I would like to suggest is, yes, please. I was going to say, you, the, the one important one that came across the very clearly. The important word is? The one important is marriage. Marriage. And although we talk about individuals and individualization, and you mentioned that several times, I think it isn't truly individualization. It's a constant marriage between God, Father, and ourselves along a particular pathway, which eventually ends up with everybody meeting in a common point. Mm -hmm. and, and intuition is a very big factor in that marriage. Mm -hmm. If we allow it to be. Sure. Well, <clears throat> um, I certainly have many times heard that let's say all of these things that start way out here so far apart we go back to the same point. Uh, but to me, it is terribly important to remind ourselves that apparently the individualization is not discarded. It is, it is a fundamental part of the value of the whole which is conserved. And incidentally, uh, Cyrus Kambata in uh, uh, <clears throat> Mumbai recently, well, a year or so ago, sent a quote that he had uh, picked up on the internet where Baba was talking to a person about, well, Baba, is all of this business uh, really unnecessary? And if we're all going back uh, to Baba, isn't it all sort of wiped out? And Baba says, no, oh, uh, it would be ridiculous that after all of the process of creation and individualization, if one went back to exactly where one had been before, well, if you go back as your son, Christ goes back as Christ, I go back as an heir God. And that is preserved in the relationship to the whole of it's not lost. So the individualization apparently is a tremendous fundamental value in itself. And I suspect that without that, then God's capacity to love and to be intimately involved in love could not have happened. So I sort of suspect that also uh, the whole capability <coughs> of loving and the manifestation of love depends upon individualized drop souls too. Boy, that's a pretty big word. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it gets more and more, uh, what should I say, reassuring to me. But are, are you suggesting that in this individuation process, that what is That's retained? That's term, by the way. Go but, ahead. But uh, what is retained is also the sanskari mold, or just in a sense the perspective of the soul? Because <clears throat> most of us, when we think of our own individuation, I think I'm done. Frank thinks he's Frank, Ben thinks he's done. But that's part of the illusion. So, can you maybe more clearly define what is the right. individual yeah. that there is saved? Yeah. Okay. So, I've got to tell you um, a success story um, with such a resounding uh, tragedy involved in it that it makes me uh, almost weep every time I think of it. Uh, as you all know, I spent an awful lot of time working also on translations of the discourses, so the discourses are terribly deep and meaningful to me. And we had a lovely individualist in Denver. Many of you have met him, I'm sure, uh, Dick Duman, uh, yeah. who has died in recent years. And Dick was a real law unto himself. And if there is ever the epitome of, uh, I've got to do it my way, and, uh, leave me alone. <laughs> if it's got to be done that way, I'll hope I get back to where I get to. So Dick, every once in a while, I go see him. And he, he had been in the wonderful group that we had in the Bay Area when he was going to law school and Linda. So uh, Dick, every once in a while, would send me things that he had gotten from hither and yon. And uh, 
uh, one of the things that uh, he sent me after Anderson, Dick Anderson, had been uh, to uh, London and called to our attention two or three discourses in uh, the last part of Sparks, you know, which is another national collection. Mm -hmm. and it didn't go into the full volume of collected discourses. But there's some very potent things about uh, what happens to uh, Sam Scarry's individuation and suggesting that maybe uh, they're not just wiped out, uh, de energized, and that's the end of them, and then this blissful rosiness of the baby of blowing his horn and becoming the god. So uh, that uh, sort of focus on maybe the thing is just a little bit different from what we have supposed in the past. And then eventually, I think uh, three or four years after Dick had been through and sort of shook us up a little bit, uh, Dick sends to me a little sort of a, almost a Hindu appearing collection of five or six discourses. Again, there was enough English. Uh, the discourses were in English, but the cover was almost entirely in Hindi. But you could see that this also had been collected by Deshmukh very, very end of his life around Baba. And here were uh, four or five discourses that I had never seen, never touched. And in one of those, Baba says just so clearly, it is a bit of a mistake to speak of the complete annihilation of the Sanskaras. In other words, just getting rid of the whole thing, bang, out of the door. Rather, it is the exhaustion of the energy, but the conservation of the form. Boy, didn't that make my eyes open? And so, in other words, uh, here was Bobby himself saying, uh, in a national collective discourse, and I would distribute it around for better or for worse, uh, that it is not less than just getting rid of erasing the contents of the mental body. You know, Mano Nash is not total destruction of the mind. It is the destruction of the energy component of the mind of the storage box. Does that make sense to you? This is this is so neat, earth shaking it seems just so light. Because after all, energy, energy, uh, if you start to reflect back, energy came into being when the wind went around creating the universe. All of these things which we know have got to finally to disappear. So energy's got to disappear, but the impression of form from an individual incident in your life is stored eternally. Mm -hmm. Space in the mental body, I am sure that what Baba said there means that when you go through what I call the final inspection. When the perfect master comes and says, now it's time for us to clean up the last of the wreckage here. And so this is why I, I think God's got his, uh, you know, sort of certified uh, quality inspection that goes through one of the perfect masters are the ones who do it. And to a very careful checking through everything that is stored left in you and just make certain that all of the things that are unreal have been abandoned and cast out, and only reality remains. But this implies, let's say, that individualized consciousness is a reality and is routine. So this discourse, uh, uh, I made a photocopy of this and we um, that we were that, and I took the original, and unfortunately, the photocopy of on them. And of course, uh, after a few months, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. And Dick and Newman died, and I couldn't even find out whether he had retained a copy of it. We'd never been able to find another copy. I went to the Deshman family in Nagpur and asked the, uh, uh, the son there whether he had ever been able to find something described them with a pamphlet to him. He said, I've never seen anything like it. And he said, it could be that when we had a flood in our basement some years ago, uh, some of the things were destroyed. And then any copy that my father kept of that was destroyed. And the flood was 
for the help. So all I can do is say there are, what, 10, 20 people in London who saw the original vegetable condition in Bob's words, and this absolutely stunning clarification. Mm-hmm. It is not quite correct to think of the total destruction of all of the Sanskara. Remember the Sanskara is both energy and form. Because the incident itself, the form of the incident, is still person, but it is not an energy pattern. What, what do you want? Well, I was just thinking of how, how the word in the, the exchanges differs from the discourses, and that when Baba talks about that spiritual progress, he says, rather than saying gross sanskars are wiped out, he says gross sanskars become subtle sanskars, mm-hmm. and subtle sanskars become mental sanskars. Mm-hmm. Not talking about annihilation anymore, mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. metamorphosis that takes place in our work that might be connected to that growth. Well, uh, I am sure it is tied in, but at any rate, uh, in that discourse he says it is all of the energy component, mm-hmm. not the form which is the individualized part of consciousness. So that's all the further I can take you on that particular one. But I, I don't think in the uh, transition from the mental conscious advanced soul to God realization, Baba makes a statement and God speaks that those mental sense errors are then wiped out when the person becomes God realized. It may, it, I, I think he leaves a pain in there, but I can't, I don't know if anybody else knows me anymore about that. Well, Baba very frequently, as you know, repeats and repeats and repeats, but I agree with you. But when you get up along there, I certainly do not remember his saying that it's all wiped out. But certainly in, in let's say, conversation, conversations with the Mongoli again and again, it has always been, they're used up. Yeah. The Sanskaras are used up, meaning they're used up, completely discarded. That's the implication. I have never been able to get a, a mandala uh, to, to listen to what I read in that discourse from Bible. I just say, well, Ron, there's a confusion somewhere. And that's the end of the story. Then uh, another yeah. thing along this line, I, I, I can't remember exactly where, but uh, when Baba speaks about the, the balancing of samskaras, I, mm-hmm. in that in that section, I remember him speaking about not not being correct to that you drain all your samskaras, but actually the good and bad or the opposites come into a balance. Mm-hmm. Do you think that has something to do with the uh, the effect of the energizing them? Well, um, certainly, I know that. Uh, Let's say our desire and emotional patterns are energized. And it takes a long time, a tremendously long time of development to, let's say, rid oneself of even a fairly simple desire pattern. And so uh, the balancing of it, I, I have always felt that the balancing is, is a temporary point. If you could capture that, probably you might be precipitated into a premature a state approaching perfection, but I can never imagine the balancing of minus energy and plus energy, just balancing them, but keeping them from wiping each other out, resulting in any permanent state of real esoteric development, and God realization. So I, I feel that the question of balancing uh, sort of leads us to a premature concept of what making real progress is, and that it is not just a question of balancing energies, but absolute wiping out of both the positive energy and the negative energy, right down to the bottom. But I thought that's what the suggestion was, that the balance actually uh, precipitates the, the uh, annihilation of both. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've never read about that balancing in that sense, to be no. honest with you. Because, boy, it's so terribly obvious that for some hundreds of thousands of times you're, when that balancing is about to occur, that you just get back into a human body and you've got all your old problems that you had when you <laughs> dropped your body. Right. That is so damn obvious, unfortunately. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> Seth. <laughs> well, my experience. <laughs>
that was an idea that was floated in the Baba world and has some reference to the discourses. But God speaks is more like the cause of this difference is that the souls have different and diverse impressions. Some scars, and just one more sentence. Most souls have gross impressions. Some souls have subtle impressions, and a few have mental impressions, and a very few souls have no impressions at all. So, in that discourse, Father said, No, it's not the whole Sanskara which has disappeared. All I can tell you is what I read. From no, I, I hear you, but that's new information. But God speaks, the bulk of God speaks seems to be that. The evolution process is not for evolution of form, but it is precipitated by evolution of consciousness. The reincarnation phase is the shaking phase, just for 8.4 lakhs to shape the strength of the bindings. Yeah. And the evolution will unwind through the subtle and mental worlds your impressions or sanskaras to there are no sanskaras and the soul perceives itself in its pure majesty of not being clouded by sanskaras. Yeah. That's the thing that God speaks, gives us. It's and, consistently in that vein. Yeah. You know, you can't argue with it at all. And certainly I've done an awful lot of work and have a tremendous love for God speaks. But nevertheless, I also know that these words came from Baba that Eshmi collected, and it has a very, very powerful role to play in, in this problem. And it's the only thing that can explain to me uh, why human beings go through so deeply, 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 uh, sometimes such terribly penetrating, sometimes such terribly tragic experiences in their lives. Anyway, this is all pure personal. You know, sort of nitpicking but it yourself. Just from your understanding or intuition, does it mean that the, ex the individuality part, like let's say you're living the life of Don Stevens right now and have the great fortune to be with Mayor Baba, but you have eight million other lifetimes, are you remembering that whole package that from just your intuitive? All of the form is remembered and I, I feel stored into ad infinitum, this is true immortality. In other words, each drop soul really is immortal. The form of the drop soul is preserved in the infinitude. It has sort of a black way. box of its experiences. It's just like there's a... Yes. They are there. They are there. They're part of God into eternity. Yeah. But the compulsion factor, the emotion factor, that is all gone out. In other words, you can be a bad boy and not have to be a bad boy. This gives me a little bit of courage, by the way. <laughs> anyway, we've got a lot of things to talk about here. And I would like to spend our few remaining minutes on another thing to do, actually, mostly with intuition, because I've been so terribly impressed of the role of intuition and I just can't imagine many, many things that I've got to know God speaks if I hadn't been deliberately taking Baba for real about this business of intuition in his avatar gift. And the particular gift that will allow us to do many, many things, including work on the spiritual path, uh, without a lot of tedious, tedious uh, processes of logic. Remember then, he told us each time, now you may feel that because of the instant and of an answer coming to you intuitively, and you're finding that it is absolutely right, uh, you would feel that, okay, all right, let's forget logic and reason and so on. But he said, I must tell you that the intuitions are not always correct. And you must check them especially the important ones practically. You must check them by the processes of reason, logic, mathematics. Just accept the whole thing and assume that it's just got to be God for you. <clears throat> but Bob is standing here implying, no, you've got to check it with reason. All right, so where 
do the imperfections when they come? Where do they come from? How do they come? And we just simply uh, said, well, Baba has impressed upon us that this material is stored not only in, uh, in cells in your head, in your brain, but it is also stored permanently in your mental body. And when you drop the physical, when you die and leave the physical body, or at the start of the, the brain uh, gets kicked out, but you're still associated with your soul body and with the mental body. And it's in the mental body uh, where all of these things are stored. So it goes on and on and on and on. And so, of course, stored in all of these memories are a lot of things that, if you're honest with yourself, you say, how could I ever have done such a thing as I remember I did at that point? God, I was a hell of a brat when I did that. Or I was really being dishonest with myself to even think I could get away with it or that I should get away with it. So any other person who has ever gotten even the first base with being honest with oneself. And this is why I'm sure Baba heart and heart and heart and heart on honesty. Boy, he really drilled that in. Just in order so that you can start turning up things and remembering things inside of yourself in your own experience that are inconsistent and that you really ought to have your posterior whip for having done it or even thought you should get away with it. So honesty leads on into this whole business of ta beginning to tackle a lot of these stored memories that one has got to come to grips with. But you know, uh, it's also, if you're really honest with yourself, you know how hard it is really to be honest with yourself in some of the situations, you know. You keep pulling the wall over your eyes and justifying yourself to yourself all of the time. And sometimes it just gets so crucifying that you develop practically an inferiority complex out of it. I think that's where a real inferiority complex comes from, just having been so brutally honest so many times with yourself that you just sort of discredit yourself to ever having done something right or something that's uncontaminated by a lot of just plain crap. Forget the term. So here we are, and uh, we were asking ourselves to the London group for quite a bit of a long time. How do we start getting to the bottom of this question of uh, corruption existing in intuitive material? How do you identify it? And as we began to ask ourselves that, we were getting to be rather aware of the fact that in this group uh, that had formed and sort of amongst themselves promised each other to really work on it and try to get honestly in the discussions and the group on towards honest appraisal of what was going on. So we began to find out that our relationship to each other was integral in this process of being honest and probably of trying to get somewhere with intuitions. And one of the first things that we began to find out was that uh, we couldn't have, let's say, just any old size group. Sometimes new people came along. We always had a room. If somebody who's been around Bob and was Bob and knocks on the door and says, we understand you're doing something uh, very interesting with the discourses or with uh, honesty or with intuition, I'd like to join in, uh, we would say, okay, come on in. But then we began to find the group get larger and larger and larger. And then when we began to suspect there's something to do with numbers uh, that doesn't work out quite right, that the group gets too large. And being, trying to be honest with ourselves, we found two things that were at stake there. One is what I call soapbox time. You know, in other words, there's only time for a limited number of people to get up on the soapbox and explain uh, what is really important to her, to themselves, is I think the correct point of it now. Uh, so, soapbox time was important. And the other thing simply is that an individual 
character is pretty deeply ingrained. And even after you've been doing a lot of honest work trying to get to the truth, you've still got an awful lot of your own individual nature and assertiveness and abruptness and so on still sitting around. And so we began to say, well, after all, isn't it expecting too much of the character digestive apparatus of an individual to digest too wide a variety of diversion, different uh, meat diets, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> and we said, yes, that's true. And so we would find, uh, certainly, that sometimes there are meat one or two people who have the assertiveness of two or three people normally. So you've got to give <laughs> sort of a, a plus two count in the uh, population chart there. <laughs> They're using up an awful lot of your digestive capability of uh, digesting different assertivenesses and so on. You know, you, you've got to be honest about these things. You just can't go on on a pink rosy cloud floating along and pretending things to yourself. You can't be real. So we said, okay, we developed sort of a mathematical formula, eight to twelve people in the group. We just found that seemed to work okay. And it got larger and that just agreed it's going to be two groups in the future. That would be all right. And the other part of it was is that uh, each person has got to have his time really to feel way down deep inside of it and put it into words. And you listen and you absorb it and you reflect as they do this. We began to find out that this had a great deal to do with uh, unrooting, uh, rooting out uh, suspected fallacies or corruption points and uh, apparently uh, spot-on intuition that somebody would have. We explained it to ourselves statistically by simply saying, well, with eight to 12 people of divergent backgrounds and divergent mental body contents, uh, when they take in uh, another person's intuition, this person will have certain things that uh, uh, correspond with it, and another person will have certain things that conflict with it. And the possibility that you will have 12 people who will all have the same background in a certain area is almost vanishingly small. So with a relatively small number of people, you can get quite a divergency of intuitive reaction to intuitions. Something way deep down either say, gee, that sounds right to me. I just like that. And another person will say, no, something or another there seems to rather. So you can go through an awful lot of social prejudice. If you do this, you're a good boy. And you can have a certain concept everybody says, to be a good boy, a good girl, you've got to do this sort of thing. This is exceptional. But it isn't necessarily true, 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 way deep down, true, God's truth. And so if a person has an intuition that somewhere or another contradicts it, uh, well, uh, there's a possibility, you know, that this is a real intuition of truth. And so being able to share these things and share whether you resonate to it and so on is terribly important. And somewhere or another we found that in this process we could get a much better clinch on where the intuition looked as if it was suspect. And then the person who would have the intuition, because that person had gone through a pretty deep probing and proving process in a group and accepting and sharing things over a period of time. And if somebody else in the group says, you know, I just gotta be honest with you. But when you say that, and this happened recently in London, one of our best old time persons said to one another, uh, yeah, you know, but when you say that, something way down inside me just shudders. <laughs> and because we trust that guy and his, his grasp of truth so much, she listened and we listened what he was saying. And he had put his finger on a terribly important thing. It seemed to be a part of offered the philosophy of God's philosophy, you know. It sounded right. But he had just this deep down shudder. And so it turned out that she had to go back and take a very careful look 
at this whole part of her rather lengthy intuition. So <clears throat> this business of what we call it simple companionship, I don't think that you know, it was Baba who, uh, with the Mondali and the new life, had what Arish and I recall to you again, one of the beautiful stories. When Arish was telling me, finally, the story of the new life, and he said, uh, what do you think of the new life? And I said, yes, it was fantastic, but really, how did you stand all of those crises one after another happening? So continue. I would have had the courage, I would have had to toss in the sponge. And Arish looked at me and literally with deep disappointment in his face, he said, and um, I have failed you because I have failed to give you the sense of the glory of companionship with the avatar that we experienced within her in the new life. And when Arish gave that as the word which typified the essence of the relationship with the avatar, I knew inside of myself, my God, that's got to be the central thing for the new life. And the new cycle of cycles problem. And quite frankly, I think that that is where the big challenge is in getting those beads on one string. And I think that is one of the biggest of all the projects which we've got to bring to fruition in the new life that we're going into. And that's where I think you and I are going to be willing to say something. So, maybe super terms, are you saying that um, maybe some of the more older traditional ways mm -hmm. um, will fall by the wayside and people will now have to work much more intuitively with spiritual practices? I, I feel that Baba knew what was necessary and he knew that intuition would be necessary to get the rushing out and spiritual practice and spiritual development in, in this new cycle of cycles. To me, it's, it's just that simple. And as I see my own experiments with intuition, proceeding, uh, I can see how much time is saved by trusting quick, just simple little intuitions in daily life, do it this way, do it that way. And so I said, well, I'll try it that way. I've never done it that way, but I will. And then just seeing all the sense of it, my God, that's a real time and energy saver. So yes, intuition is there and it's our responsibility to use it. But we've got to use it in relation to the rest of humanity too. I think Robert put his devotees in a position of enormous trust and responsibility in relation to getting the show on the road of the new humanity, living the new life by the new principles that he laid down. I call it the new homesteading area of God's consciousness. And it's just, just that fundamental, going out into the wild prairies and staking out and Helping other people stake out something so grand, no, no choo choo trains running around or anything in this car. We're the ones who are going to get the trains running. What would you like? I just wanted to clarify your definition of intuition. And the reason why I'm asking that is I had always thought of intuition as that inner knowing where you cut past the logic element and just know. Mm -hmm. So, it seems to me if it's genuine intuition, it's, it's accurate. You, you, you put one sentence that I couldn't quite understand just now. And it seems to me that if it's genuine intuition, yeah. it's going to be accurate. And so if it's... Baba said no. Right, and that's the part and I'm not... I want to explain just a little bit about that because this gets into deep uh, uh, principles of fields of energy. And we just got to go through it. <clears throat> If, let us say, there is uh, something stored in your mental body, which is composed of two parts, and Bob is clear on this, one, an energy, a knot of energy, and another, a form part. What happens when for some reason or another in your nervous system, something is going by this particular energy knot in this particular form? It's going to be influenced by it. It can't escape. There's no way that it can get into your physical body, into physical action, without transiting somewhere around through or near your mental body. And that's where all of these things, and everything I know from the laws of physics tells me that if you've got stored energy here, it will have an influence on 
transiting energy that's going by it and will modify it in some fashion or another. This is fundamental physics, and we live in a world of fundamental physics. To me, this is where the coloring of intuition comes in, because I think it started out in God Avatar Draw Soul as a true one, but then it's got a complicated transit through the rest of this. I always put it as sort of like a, a tree, and you know, it comes down from here and it goes in by the mental body and the subtle body, and then into the physical body. And in that transiting, that is a perilous voyage. And there's no way that you, that you can completely shield even a strong intuition from some of the things that's going to have to go by in order to get out into existence and action. Does that make any sense? So would you say that theoretically there's pure intuition, but practically there's really not? I don't say theoretically. I say I'm dead convinced there is such a thing starting out mm -hmm. in the drop soul, God, avatar, part of you and me, which starts its journey. And as soon as it gets out from there, it becomes a more and more perilous journey where things can happen. And we've got to be honest that things do. And that's what Baba wanted. You've got to test these things. And the important ones, you've got to go back to the slow process and check it by just the mechanical means of calculus or whatever is going to be applied to it. So this is being real. And Baba emphasized that to me again and again and again when I would want to take a shortcut by a, some sort of a psychic trick. And I would say, uh, remember, you and I live in the world, the physical world, and let us obey the principles of the physical world, even in our contacts. How can, how can it be put more simply than that? And he insisted on sticking by that. Well, this whole business of, of uh, admitting, I would say, that intuition, which I know is so important, I, I just see how many things in God Speaks came to light and extended out into a whole new field. Sometimes I'd start having an intuitive train, and it would go on for weeks and months, chapter after chapter after chapter, of exciting adventures into the unknown. So, in order to, uh, let's say, uh, use God Speaks as the fundamental starting point that Baba gave us, and then carry it into the more detailed part, and then, let's say, make it available to any people around and help it to guide your life and help to suggest how other people can use some of the principles, we're going to have to do an awful lot of realistic handling of intuition. Incidentally, uh, several of us uh, got very interested, what, six, eight years ago, Cynthia and Richard, mm -hmm. and uh, starting to put down some of these principles of intuition and the booby traps involved in personal stories. So uh, we gradually scribbled up, and uh, the Griffins did the final editing of that, and that is available, you know, in Baba Bar. I do recommend, as uh, sort of a beginning shower uh, that uh, you read through that. I think it will clarify some of the things we're talking about today. But the reason that I heart back on it and heart on it, I have found in my own personal experience how enormously important the intuitive process is in handling and utilizing and doing what I feel is my responsibility to Baba in relation to God Speaks. Yeah. Now, before we close, I'm going to ask, you were fortunate to be with Mayor Baba and do great editing work and all praise to you for that, but in the advent of Mayor Baba, there was maybe, besides his mom, there were just a few hundred people that had access to him in a personal way, not like a mass darshan of 70,000 people or something. So, out of the six billion people who are on the planet, it's a very, very zero, zero, zero point, just a small amount of people that have access to use the avatar as their personal living master in that way. Most of us go through the process, whether you use this term intuitively or running around in the dark. So, 
possibly you may want to link uh, intuition that for not just us in this room, but for humanity, your thoughts of... Bob, I emphasize my gift of intuition is generally available to all of you. He used those words, and forgive me for not having brought them up. But how do you feel with intuition? But what is for future generations who will not even have a Don Stevens to listen to that, that may or not, but there's just books sure. and inner contact or guidance yeah. that inevitably, it seems, unless the avatar comes and goes on TV shows to broadcast to everybody, you're going to have to be groping in the dark. So not in the dark because uh, Baba has left some thousands of people that he's had great influence on. And also I find out to you, there's one other little story I just have to quickly tell you. Uh, and I'm referring to the musts. We have underappreciated what Baba was doing mm -hmm. with the musts. And he gave me the key to it, quite frankly, when we were walking in Lower Mondale Hall, Erich Bob and myself Bob points to the door. Said, Don, you know who lives there? And I said, Yes, Muhammad. He said, Have you gotten to know Muhammad? And I said, Oh, well, really, good father. But you know, he's still awfully strange. <laughs> and when I said that, I said, Oh my God, I put me in a mud puddle over there. And so I thought he was going to ball me out. And he said, Well, no, Don, you're quite, quite correct. I, I do handle as a psychologist the bewitchment with the experience. I can unbewitch them so that they can concentrate on so called reality around them again. But in addition to that, there is something that has happened to them, which is not generally known, and which I have not generally explained. The strength of that emotional experience that God is so great, it does permanent brain damage to them. And that I am not going to do a miracle to cure that and give them a new brain. But when they are born into their next proper functioning body, all of that spiritual experience will be available to them and to humanity. Think of the treasure trove of those thousands of must who are being born into the world at present. This tremendous, tremendous spiritual availability. So this is another one of the things. And then I always remember an old professor of sociology that I had. He said, you know, I have something that I call the growing points of humanity. I noticed that wherever I go, wherever I teach, there are always a certain number of people who have had special treatment, special background, and they are the growing points. And a few of these growing points, next to thousands, even millions of people, have an incredible effect upon them. This is what I think Bob did with us. And we've got to go out and have our effect on people. That's our responsibility. We can share it. I finished. <laughs> Thank you.